on episode 2 of Ball State Baseball Believe 2016. Watch as we head into the heart of SEC country. Step into the life of right fielder Alex Call. Learn about junior pitcher Zach Plesak. And meet one of sophomore pitcher Mitch Gibson's biggest fans. Ball State Baseball Believe starts now. champion is somebody who believes in themselves. The champion is somebody who puts in the time. The champion is somebody who can raise the level of the teammates around them. As Ball State students headed home for spring break, our team packed the bus and headed down south to begin our spring break trip. Playing teams like Oregon State in the Pac-12, um, Old Miss and the SEC and then three games against uh, powerhouse LSU you know what a great experience for these guys I just think for our kids to have the opportunity to compete against the best is how you get better the atmosphere at LSU was like an experience like I've never had before in my baseball life it was awesome best baseball experience of my life when you get down there it gives you the feel of a major league or a minor league baseball field so when you step out onto the field and you see all like the accolades up there and kind of uh, all the stands, everything, it's, it's hard not to get overwhelmed, but uh, we knew we were there for a purpose and we knew that we could compete with anybody and uh, that atmosphere is something we kind of thrived in. It gave us all confidence. We can, uh, we can play with anyone in the country. Um, you know, it's, you know, you beat one of the best teams in the country and I just, all of a sudden you're going to games, you know, thinking just, you know, if we beat them, there's no reason why I can't beat the net, you know, these guys. I just think in the big scheme of uh, uh, a player's collegiate experience to be able to play against quality teams like that on, in great venues with great crowds, I mean that's college baseball. One key component in the win at LSU was junior right fielder Alex Call. He has started out the season on fire, but that is no surprise to us. I've been searching for a home run. There's been balls that I've hit earlier this year that I definitely thought were going to be home runs, and I'm getting a little frustrated. But when I hit that one, I knew it was going to be a breaking ball. Um, guy in scoring position, and uh, you know, I, I got it. That uh, was probably one of my most special moments in my career in that atmosphere, and, you know, because after that, you know, we were up 3 nothing, and people were starting to be like, whoa, what's going on? Those um, 
home runs give the team a huge confidence boost. And especially when you're playing such a great team like that against a great pitcher. He goes the extra mile when um, uh, we don't have to be um, working out on Tuesdays and Thursdays in the off season. That dude's out there conditioning on his own. I played football in high school, and so I had an advantage on most of the kids coming here. So I had been squatting for about four or five years before I came here. And... For his power numbers are going up. He could have a few more homers right now. He's hit the ball really hard on some days when the wind was blowing in. It's a product of working hard, you know, and just trying to push yourself to do that extra rep to put that extra weight on. And, um, you know, when you do something like that and your teammates are all cheering you on, it's really special. Alex Call is a player like, like I've never been around before. Um, he's very energetic, very charismatic, and he's awesome to be around. He's a leader even when he doesn't need to say anything, so he leads by example, which I think is honestly the best leader that you can have. He leads by how he plays. He's not the rah-rah guy, he's not the vocal guy. He, uh, he leads by example. and. Uh, you know, certainly um, having an outstanding player like Alex is, um, you know, contagious to the rest of the guys. I know for a fact that Alex has a pro potential. And I can say that because sometimes people can get along on talent alone, but Collie works harder than anybody else on this team, and he's willing to do whatever it takes to get to the next level. I'm not the biggest guy in the world. I'm not the 6'4", 220, can't miss prospect. But I think that I have an advantage over people because of the way I approach the game mentally. That's just a foregone conclusion that's gonna happen. So um, it just, it'll be interesting to see where he goes in the draft. It's hard to say. It's, you know, you can't get in the minds of those uh, scouts and such, but he'll he'll definitely have the opportunity after this season. A lot of it's out of my hands, but a lot of it's in my hands as well, and you got to play to make it happen. That's what I want to do, and if I got that chance, it would be, uh, you know, unforgettable. Coach Maloney continually stresses that we must do the little things correctly on the field to be successful. One of those areas is bunting. Hey guys, my name is Ryan Spalding. I'm second baseman on the baseball team, and we're going to talk about bunting today. Uh, there's three types of bunts that we uh, practice here at Ball State. The first one is a sacrifice bunt. The second one is a bunt for a hit, which we call a drag down the third baseline. And the third one is a push bunt, which is a bunt for a hit down the first baseline. So first bunt is sacrifice that we're gonna talk about. When you're sacrificing, you're giving yourself up for the team. So you scoot open the box, get a good athletic stance, bend your knees, then you square. You wanna put the bat out in front of your face, about have your head right where the barrel is so you can see it. Um, if the ball is above your barrel, so if it's up here high, it's easy to take. And then if it's low, you just bend your knees. Um, just let, well, the good, uh, way I like to think about it is you have a glove on your barrel and you can just catch it, you catch the ball. When you bunt, you wanna set your angle to first or to third. You can use the plate as your guide if you're having trouble. That's the sacrifice. Um, the second bunt we talk about is the drag bunt, which is a bunt for a hit down the third baseline. Um, it's a little different. You don't square as early as the sacrifice. You're in the back of the box, and there's two ways we teach the footwork for this, for righties. Um, the first way, this is one I do, uh, I feel like I'm most comfortable with, is the shuffle. So you kind of, you shuffle up, you're in good running form because you want to get to first base pretty quick. 
and you set your angle towards third and you want to put it on the foul line or foul. So in fair territory on the line or foul. Okay? So you're doing it as a pitcher has his foot land. So when the pitcher's coming down, you square. Okay? So we'll do a few of those. The third bunt we're going to talk about is uh, the push bunt. It's kind of a bunt for a hit. You want to put it right between first base, the first base and the second base one. So the way you do that is the same with a sacrifice. You step up, you set your angle, and you push. That's why we call it a push. Um, so ideally, you want to get an outside pitch on the outside corner, and then you just step up and push, and then you run. You get in good running form. Junior pitcher Zach Plesak has anchored the Ball State pitching staff for three years. Despite all the success, he continues to stay true to his roots. I play for my school, my teammates, you know, community, where I came from, my family. I have to respect and live up to everything they've done for me because without everybody that influenced my life, I wouldn't be where I am. Ever since I've been growing up, and you know, I've never wanted anything more than to be a professional baseball player. I guess his first grade teacher had asked him what he wanted to be when he grew up, that he wanted to be a major league baseball player. And he came home really mad because she had told him, you have to choose something realistic, that's not going to happen. I just expect a lot out of myself you know and I work so hard to be so good I expect myself to be good because of the work I put in. He's I mean a lot of people know but he's super competitive. I mean well he was always like competitive really competitive. He always wants to be in first place he always wants to you know be ahead of the pack. Baseball's taught me so much. You know, I think it's just taught me how to be tough and um, just being passionate about something you care about so much can you know, influence your life in such a way that you make sacrifices and you um, push through some tough times necessarily that wouldn't happen if you didn't play the game or you know, even um, become, just becoming stronger as a person because the failure level in baseball is so high. Sports is in our family. Uh, this is a, a common thing in our family. Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, bring your gloves because after eating, we go outside and we play catch and we play long toss. It was a given every holiday and it still happens to this day. Uh, it all started with my dad and I playing catch in the backyard. Um, I had a twin brother so we, he would play catch with both of us and we would just go back and forth, see which one, who would throw it harder. My dad was usually my coach when I was, when I was in Little League, my dad was the coach all the way up through Little League and um, so I was always not challenged more, but I was expected more of myself and also my brother because of my dad being the coach. And he did the, a lot of the pushing. Um, I kind of sat back and, I mean, I wasn't like, if he did something amazing, you know, I wasn't upset about it, you know, I was just, I was trying to do that, you know, what, maybe it was the way he made that throw or the way, anything like that. Uh, it's just, I tried to do that next time. They, there was a rivalry in the fact that they pushed each other, like if, like the big thing when they were 12 was home runs and um, one of them would get ahead and then the other one would, you know, catch up and then get ahead and then, so it was like a healthy, never, never a jealousy. I'm very proud. Um, such a good kid besides the athletics. Um, there's so many people that tell me what great sons you have. And just that alone to me is more important than any statistic. I'm very proud of what he's accomplished. I try to take each day to day, like I try not to push anything too far ahead. Like I want him to finish college. I want him, to, you know, each step 
because that's kind of the kind of kid he is, you know, like one step at a time, don't get ahead of yourself. There's never been a time where I've been told that I need to perform well or I need to be good because my family was good. You know, I think it just comes down to what I wanted and my dad and parents and families have all respected that ever since I've been growing up. And you know, I've never wanted anything more than to be a professional baseball player. And I'm just focusing on, you know, taking one process, one chapter, step at a time and to hopefully get where I can get to. It is often said that there is a lot more to life than baseball. For sophomore pitcher Mitch Gibson, his responsibilities off the field might be his biggest job. I got a phone call and I remember the day. It was January 13th, the morning, it was probably 8.30 in the morning. I get a call from Shelby. He said, no, you're lying. I was like, no. It was kind of a slow conversation. Um, I wasn't really feeling my best, and I just needed to make sure that somebody was up there with her to be okay. Right in the middle of the baseball season and traveling and all this hectic stuff, um, you know, would I have rather been home? Probably yes, but could I control that? No. So, you know, we're hit with things in life that were not expected. Like her being in the hospital, not knowing what's going on at all times during the day. You just really worry about them because it's up and down how she was every day. She could be good one day, the next day she wasn't having a good day. It's just very, very stressful on anybody. One thing that she said that really was like, man, God really has her in her hands was when she said that, you know, she came out and she was, she let out a little cry. I said, for a baby that was one pound and, she, you know, born at 26 weeks, letting out a cry is pretty, pretty impressive. And she says, hey, Brooklyn was born. I was, I was like, hold on, did I just hear what I think I said? Like, what are you talking about? Because she wasn't supposed to be born until April. She's like, yeah, she was born this morning, uh, was rushed to the hospital. Um, she got lifeline to St. Vincent's. Um, she's in the NICU. She's under care right now. And the fact that she was able to, you know, breathe on her own for just a little bit before they got her to the hospital was really, really cool as well. Shelby didn't really get to see her that much because, you know, it was a bang bang thing when she was born. You know, she saw her for a second, didn't really get to put hands on her or hold her because they had to hurry up and get her to the NICU. Um, so I rushed immediately. I called Coach Malone. He's like, hey, Coach, your situation. And he just, you know, he goes, you know, if you ever need anything, you can always, you know, get a hold of me. Um, just explain things to me ahead of time, and I'll, you know, I'll bear with you. And he does. He supports me 100%. Um, just like all the guys on the team do, they support me. He stayed the course. He's been there um, for his daughter. Certainly in the big scheme of life, that's far more important than the great game of baseball. Um, and he's done a great job of balancing that. I'm proud of him for that. Her name's Brooklyn. Brooklyn just turned a year old in January. Um, January 13th was her first first birthday. She actually is a smaller one year old because she was born four months premature. Um, she was born at a pound 15 ounces. Um, she was in the NICU um, in St. St. Vincent's in West Side Indianapolis um, for four months. And uh, you know, later towards the end of the baseball season last year, I think actually the MAC championship game was the day she came home. Um, you know, it's kind of a situation, I was like, man, do I need to go home and help take her home, this and that. Um, and luckily my girlfriend back home was, you know, was able to um, say, no, you stay, you stay there, you play the game, um, you know, I'll take care of everything at home and we'll see you tomorrow. So that was something that was rough for me. Uh, last year I was, you know, battling back and forth, going to school, coming to baseball, going back home, um, going to the hospital to see her, uh, really rough, rough time. Um, but I don't think any of this would be possible without my girlfriend who's, you know, busted her butt. She was up at the hospital every single night for four months straight um, with Brooklyn by her side. So that was just something really cool. It was hard at first because I was up at the hospital every day and he was at school and he couldn't drive up to Indy every day. But just being able to text him every day and tell him positive news about Brooklyn, it really just helped us. It's just real tough because at that point when she was born, I didn't have a car on campus. So it was, you know, opportunities that whenever guys on the team were able to let me borrow their car, that was the time I was going to be able to go home. If he ever has a problem, I drop everything for sure. And I know he'd do the same thing for me because he's kind of like a brother to me. And um, 
I mean, I love the dude. He's like my brother. I think having my parents and my girlfriend's parents, um, our parents have been so, so helpful, especially hers, um, being able to help babysit while my girlfriend Shelby's at work or this and that. And, you know, while I'm at school, she's, she's able to stay home. So it's just, you know, things couldn't be any better than how you are right now. Things could have been a lot worse. I think she's changed my life, but I've had to mature real quick. Um, you know, I do like to joke around every once in a while. You can tell he's grown up a ton, which I really respect that. Time comes once baseball is over and once practice is over, you know, lifting's done. You know, I'm going home. I'm going to go home. I'm going to be with my family. Um, that's what matters to me at that point. I'm not going to worry about baseball throughout the day. I mean, when practice has happened and practice has happened, that's my full focus. But once practice is over, my family's going to be at my focus. She loves Mitch. She loves her daddy. Um, she's happy. She claps. She yells. She's excited. There's something I always have, you know, in my hat because, you know, family means a lot to me. Um, I'll have my hat. I have a cross in the middle of my hat. And then I have Brooklyn on one side and then Shelby on the other side. And I'll, you know, I always say a little prayer. I always bend down and I always say, Lord, me and you. Shelby, Brooklyn, love you guys. Um, so I always know I have them in the back of my head, and you know, Brooklyn went through all that. I think I can go on the mountain and pitch, you know, two or three innings and be fine. Um, she's sitting there with oxygen and stuff on her all the time, so I think that's, you know, I'm breathing fresh air on the pitching mound, you know, on the field. Nothing's better than that. After spending most of the first part of the season on the road, it is great to be able to come back and play on our own field. This year, that excitement is even greater since we get to play on our brand new ballpark. Well, part of the process when they brought me back was knowing that the only way we were going to come back is if they were going to make a commitment to do this. First, they were going to piecemeal it and do just a turf infield. And then they were going to, um, you know, only do a Wayne's, I think it's called a Wayne's wall brick, so a four foot high brick wall around the stadium. And that would have just been putting something together saying we have a field. What they did here is they built the dugouts well, they built, they turfed the whole field. They put a nice, they didn't brick the whole thing, but they bricked it a lot so it looks really classy. And um, the outfield uh, graphics are just phenomenal. For me, when I saw that, it's eye popping, really brought the stadium to life. He kind of told us this little dream he had, and it was almost like surreal because we were like, you know, we see what we have right here, but he wants to take it from here all the way up to here. The coach only did, I, I mean, I can't even go to tell you how much he did because I'm sure he did so much that us players can't even comprehend. I know a lot of people put a lot of hard work into it, so it's nice to see it all come into one, and hopefully, if he wants to expand on it, we can expand. But if not, I think it's perfect just the way it is. I just feel really good about what the university and the donors did um, to represent Ball State Baseball. We took on the Dayton Flyers in our home opener. Strong pitching and timely hitting allowed us to win the first three games of the series. However, Dayton rallied to take the series finale. It was exciting to be in our park and have our fans there, and, the, and especially on the first day, having a really nice crowd despite cold elements was very pleasing. We didn't really know what to expect coming back because, like I said, it was kind of cold. The wind was blowing, but they were they were awesome. There was the stands were packed. People were kind of out on the sides here, and it's just awesome to come back and play back in Muncie in front of friends and family, and it's it's just really comforting. Um, it's good to be home. You know, I, I was talking, I looked at Jared and Caleb when we went out there for the, you know, during the National Anthem. I was like, man, it, it doesn't really feel like a game. You know, it's just, you know, because we're used to playing on the road, you know, crowds are against you. You know, it just felt comfortable. We prepare all off season, even leading up to this, and uh, the preparation really has us ready to come out and play.
We actually had all three facets of the game for the first three games in particular. We hit well, we got some timely hits, we had the big inning, we pitched really well, and we fielded really well. If you do those three things, you're going to win a lot of games. This team's capable of doing those three things. One thing we did really well, we threw a lot of strikes as pitchers. You know, just pounding the strike zone. Didn't walk a whole lot of guys, and I think that's why we had a lot of success on the mound. I think that it sets a good tone for us this season. We're, we're kind of hitting our stride right now. Early on in the season, we kind of struggled a little bit. We were very inconsistent at the plate, and now the last week or week and a half, we've really been consistent at the plate, we've been consistent in the field, we've been consistent on the mound, and that's really helping our team take off right now. To be in our park, to play in front of a good crowd, you know, and play well, it was, it's awesome. On the next episode of Ball State Baseball Believe, Follow along as we get into the heart of the conference season. Learn about junior center fielder Matt Eppers and see how outfielder Roman Bisa has overcome many trials to be at Ball State. Ball State Baseball Believe 2016 is a production of Ball State Sports Link. Follow our team on Twitter at BallStateBB and catch every episode and feature this season by following at BSU Sports Link.